Hi, welcome to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Thanks for joining the conversation. Hello, everyone. And hello, hello, Oscar. Hello, hello, Mimi. Is that how we're greeting each other now? No. Always super formally. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> After I say hello, should my mouth keep moving? Hello! Like a Chinese Shaw Brother, mm -hmm. Hong Kong Kung Fu movie? Brother, I... <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> I can, but I'm going to pass. All right. Speaking of uh, Shaw Brothers, we had my dad over the other day, and you thought it would be fun to put on My Young Auntie, one of your favorites. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly why I love that one. But I love it. Because there's a really pretty uh, Chinese lady in it. Okay. And growing up, you probably were like, wow. And she does kung fu okay. or something. That's a very reasonable. <laughs> that actually makes a lot of sense. Why well, I like that movie now. It makes perfect sense. So for those listening, we are here in our home gym again, stretching and moving around, which I think leads to us being a little bit like even more tangent, tangential than usual. But... Um, it looks like you've got your laptop there. I don't know if that means you've got questions or what's going to happen. But The it's laptop been... means that I always have things to talk about. Okay. It's been <laughs> a really busy several weeks. We went to Portland. You went to Seattle. You did some Strong First stuff. I went to Rose City Comic Con, which our listeners hopefully have seen a lot of those interviews. Lots been going on. And then we had the Wallum 43rd anniversary of the Wallum Temple, as well as my dad's 85th birthday. We had a bunch of Wallum people in town, and we are kind of winding down from that and also getting ready for a big Asia trip. There's a, always a lot going on. Always a lot going on. You know what's funny is that I personally, yeah, me, not you, it's me, hate saying that I'm busy. Right. I know that. Okay. <laughs> I, know you hate I don't. When, I you don't. hate when someone says, "How have you been?" and you go, "Oh, I've been so busy." I don't like that. I don't right. like answering that way. Yeah, yeah. Normally, I actually don't answer that way. Most people go, "Oh my gosh, you've been so busy." Right, right. <laughs> um, I think it's because it takes away your autonomy when you say that, mm, right? Okay. So, but it, and, but yeah. it actually has been busy. Oh, it's been very busy. <laughs> it's been ridiculously busy. I'm just saying, we're talking just us two. I'm just saying when, if someone that I haven't seen in a while asks me, hey, how are you doing? I really try not to say I'm busy, even if I'm super busy. Right. Because everybody's busy. Everyone's busy in their own way. And yes. also, but everything I... that we do, mm. ultimately, we decide to do it. Right. But I don't know if saying I'm busy means it's negative. It's not. Oh, okay. That's why I said just me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm sure we've talked about this before, but in any case, it's um, a bit of a wrap, not a wrap up episode, but a bit of a, okay, catch up. Here's where, because we were kind of going strong for a minute there. We had back to back episodes so much that our editing team said, is this another, is this a repeat? It's you guys again. I'm like, no, no, it's, it's us again. We're just, we just can't stop talking. So, it's been a minute, though. What do you want to talk about? Do you want me to... I well, mean, I don't I, like know. I, I mean, you've got the laptop open. I have my laptop because that way I'll always have something to, to talk on. Right. So, for our listeners, I just I mentioned kind of the sequence of events. I would like to speak a little bit on how grateful I am that we were able to have such a milestone celebration with so many people from around the world mm -hmm. because we had people from Switzerland and Germany log on to spend time with us. I think this was the first time I gave a history lecture, history and philosophy of Wallum lecture to kind of the masses, <laughs> have I say, how you say, it, just a multitude of students from different schools that were gathered. And we had workshops kind of with different seafoods from all over. And I think it's been a long time since we've had an event like this. But I think it was also the first time that I that I did that type of lecture. And so I just want to talk for a moment on the amount of gratitude I have for the ones that made it such a priority to be there to help 
and then the students who made it such a priority to attend and not to be petty, but really those who weren't there missed out on something phenomenal. It's not petty because there's always a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. What you choose to do shows where your priorities are. And that's not being negative. That's just everything. And in anything that you choose to do, you're making that a priority. And that's another thing that I guess I don't like is when you say, I just can't be there. Well, I don't know if I don't like that. Well, I guess sometimes you can't because sometimes you there's another can't. event you committed to or but there's a wedding or right. something, right? There's certain times but then, you can't. But then there's always things that you end up doing because you have to do it. And so when you have to do something, it becomes a priority. And I'm not saying that this event was a, on a have to do thing. Yes. What I'm saying is... There's always a choice. There's always a choice to do something. And then also there is... Um, Maybe what it is, is is that when people would then complain about, well, I really wish that I was there. Mm -hmm. And it's really, well, when you look at the course of a year, because you plan things really way in advance, mm -hmm. it's a prioritization thing. Yeah. So I guess that's really what it is. But this it makes it sound negative when, when I don't want it to be, because it was an amazing event. If you didn't go and you're a Wallum student, then you really missed out. Right. But that doesn't mean that you don't have a valid reason for not being there. Of course, of course. I just, I, when I say petty, I just mm -hmm. kind of mean it. it's like every time we go to plan these events, it's pulling teeth to get people to right. sign up and go. And then when they, the ones that do sign up and go are like, we want more. We wish it could have been four more hours or a full day or longer workshops. We want to do it again next year. And I'm like, do you guys remember? what a pain it was for you all to sign up in time. And mm -hmm. just the, the just that aspect of it, I think, is what frustrates me. And then all the people who was like, oh, I wish I had gone. I didn't know it was going to be like that once all the students start talking about the energy and how much they learned right, and right. how many of their cousins they met or the ones that came down from out of town and made such an effort. Because I know it's not easy to travel these days, right? right? In the middle of the, the, the week. And, and I know it was technically, you know, holiday weekend with Indigenous Peoples Day. But like, it still was so, I think I want to put the emphasis on how grateful I am that the people were there, were there. And I hope that they got as much out of it as I perceived that they have. Because it was really a special energy. And I think that people maybe who have close family that have family reunions that really connect on a special level. Like I feel like they may understand what that's like, but on a martial sense and a Wallum sense, there's a real special dynamic there. That's so unique right. to Wallum. And I was just so grateful to be kind of surrounded by that. And I, I feel like it's, it's me as a Sifu just wishing everyone could experience it because they would then really have a depth of, appreciation for Wallum that maybe they didn't prior to experiencing something like that. I just feel like I would want that for all the students to have that window of opportunity or that that insight to what we have in our system because you don't get it on a day to day. But I think it's more of that my feeling of wishing everybody could participate. Yep, that makes perfect sense. It was a great event. And yeah, you did a great job in your speech. <laughs> there was your there lecture. Was, your there lecture. was a lot of um, unexpected twists and turns, but that is that is the way of life. But it was yeah. a good time. What's funny is is people will see you do that lecture and say, "Wow, you're just a natural speaker, and you're so good at it." But you, it's not. There was a lot of planning, right? You planned it. You you thought about what you wanted to speak about. You wrote it out. You you kind of timed it. So when things go really well, even even if there are unexpected things, it's because you plan for it. It's because you practice, right? So if you are very diligent and, and, and focused and planning, then on the day of, you have the flexibility to adapt. Yeah, to I think situations. it's also just like the Chan fam way of also having flexibility to roll with the punches, literally. I think, and I have no... Uh, Ill, 
I have no negativity about this, but in my mind, I'm thinking, if I were a student, I would be like, wow, the best part of Sifu Mimi's speech was when Grandmaster Chan got up and did Kung Fu. Which was unplanned. <laughs> Which is totally unplanned. But, you know, mm -hmm. to be fair, that was probably the most exciting part of my speech, which obviously wasn't my lecture. It was right. just Grandmaster Chan being who he is. And that was exciting for us all. But in any case, to the laptop. <laughs> <laughs> It's a perfect segue talking about history, actually, because yeah. there's a thought with that. Um, I don't really listen to this podcast that much anymore. You know why? It's I love Malcolm Gladwell, that revisionist history. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I'm not, listen, I love you, Malcolm Gladwell, but I just am not paying for any more subscriptions, right? So every <laughs> podcast group now has, oh, ad free. Yeah. And uh, sometimes when things have too many ads and like, let's say I was outside this morning and I'm, I'm digging in the dirt. I can't take my phone out and fast forward ads. So sometimes I'm listening to things and if they have an ad, I just get mm. annoyed. Yeah. That is a big segue to this comment of revisionism, which okay. is we all engage in, which is we like to all say, here's what I feel happened as opposed to what actually happened. Yeah. And we all do it. And I, I think about how often I do it. I try to always remind myself because I always paint myself in a better light. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about if a situation happened and less than five minutes later, I'm speaking to you about it. I am repeating that interaction in a way that I know is making me sound better. It's not necessarily a lie, but I am the hero in my story. Okay. And so I extrapolate that out towards everyone else. And I think everyone else does that. Right. And so it just makes me wonder, like, because I know that I, I know that I do it and I know that I, I, I make myself sound better than what I really what really happened in a situation. I know that when I hear people say something where they feel um, uh, not not they, they feel like um, a grievance <laughs> that they were wrong, that they maybe, were wrong or that we just don't have the bigger picture because it's impossible to have the bigger picture. Mm. And um, and so, I don't know. That's just a thought that I have all the time because because you and I talk about a lot of things and a lot of times you're like, oh, well, what happened? I'm like, well, here's what happened. And sometimes while I'm saying it, I'm like, man, I'm making myself sound better than the situation that actually happened. Okay, so <laughs> a couple things. Two things. Uh, one is that I think that when you started to talk about that, that led me to wonder if this is why we have so many entitled people in the world, because in their mind, they've worked a narrative that is where they are the hero or the victim, even, right? And perhaps those of us that try, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, to rethink scenarios and situations and reflect on them, it will then prevent us from heading down that entitlement path or blame game path or anger path when maybe there didn't need to be anger or something like that. I think this goes back to when we have actions and then we reflect on those, we can then try to be as objective as possible so that we can look at two sides of the story or right. the different picture and then make our best decision or counsel and speak to others about it to get advice if it's something that's challenging or controversial but like sharing that story having conversation and i think this is also why conversation with another human at the end of the day is positive definitely not just for companionship but also because then you can bounce things off of one another and say, hey, did I overreact here or am I right in just flipping tables, right? Mm -hmm. And and sometimes it feels good to have that validation that we definitely should have flipped the table or I would have flipped the table too. Or we take a step back and say, oh, actually, now that I'm saying it out loud, I realize I was feeling these things because other things happened leading up to that. I had mm -hmm. already lost my patience by that point. This person came, asked me the wrong thing at the wrong time. I may have overreacted or like we have kind of a, a a train of thought that leads us to then the next time maybe make a better decision or just be more conscious of ourselves, right? I think you always say, oh, we always paint ourselves as the hero mm -hmm. or I think you always say hero and in my mind, I feel like people, 
think they're victims more than heroes. In okay. A sense. But either way, I guess yeah. um, the center of the story. Yeah. Like the, right. The world right. is revolving uh, around the main character the syndrome. The main character. Yes. And I've just, I feel, because I think about this a lot and I talk about it a lot, that I'm just always going to be failing at it. Because just this past Friday in a class, I said something as an instructor. I was like, wow, that was way out of line. I'm like, why did I do that? Or I had a conversation with a client of mine where I know I should be asking more questions, but instead I'm imparting knowledge. And at the end, I'm like, what the heck, man? You know better. Even if at the end both parties feel good, I'm always thinking, I could have done that better. What, what the heck? <laughs> and but it's, to it's, err is human, right? To err is human. And, but but I, I'm saying this out loud and maybe people think, oh, you're, Oscar, you're too harsh on yourself. I'm not because things just brush off. I'm just saying I say this, it's like right here, and then when I walk away, it flies off. You know what I mean? I don't carry it with me. I just, after every interaction like that, I'm like, what the heck, man? You know better. You, should have, you shouldn't have done that. All right. And I'm, I, so I guess to your point of like what leads to the positive side of that is that it, it has led me, hopefully, to be more forgiving of others because I know that I've been in the past and still currently sometimes very judgy <laughs> towards other people. Mm -hmm. And then, so then I look and I go, oh, okay, I, I at least have the thought right now, maybe not when it happens in real time, <laughs> that I can be more forgiving and more understanding of other people. And ourselves. And ourselves. Yeah, I'm, I'm, all, yeah, I'm always going to forgive myself. Mm -hmm. I have to because you can't go around like beating yourself down, right? But so, so many people do. Right. So yeah. half of our listeners are resonating with what you say and the other half are thinking, I'm never the lead character. I'm always a supporting role because mm -hmm. I just want to put everyone else's needs first or I'm so empathetic or nurturing or uh, maybe f they feel overlooked and then maybe they are really hard on themselves all the time. Can I have some of your water? You can, but you know why you can have this water? Okay, tell me. One, because I'll always share anything with you. <laughs> but two, because you made this for me. <laughs> yes. So listeners, um, sorry you can't see, but if you go to the YouTube, you'll see our really cool new wall lum tumblers that have the ability to keep things hot or cold. Man, technology is amazing. This is a huge tangent. And it's tangent. 30 ounces, which is great. Yes. And, well, um, yeah. Well, while you're sipping water, I'll talk a little more about Malcolm Gladwell because when Outliers came out, we both loved that book. Mm. And, and this, again, because we are all the central character in our story, we find things and we, we latch onto them, right? And say, mm -hmm. wow, this, this speaks to me. And that 10,000 hour rule really spoke to, to both of us because of that Chinese philosophy of, you know, when you're learning the double-edged sword, well, it yeah. takes 10,000 hours to master this. Days. Um, 10,000 days. Yeah. Um, and I guess it's just the number 10,000 was yeah. this thing. And so with that 10,000 hour rule, <laughs> I had heard something where Malcolm Gladwell was speaking and he said the biggest thing that he wished that he had made clear with that book was that um, not just that excellence takes time, because that's what a lot of people took out of it, but that if excellence takes time, then it also requires a lot of help, mm -hmm. right? So this again goes back to us being, you know, I keep saying the hero of our own story, right? But this false, this myth, and it's a very American myth of the pull yourself by your own bootstraps. Yeah. I'm the one who did it alone. I put 10,000 hours into this. This is why I excelled when you don't take into account that all the help that you got. A community of people is what's required in order for you to do those 10,000 hours. If you're an expert violinist, you're, someone was driving you there, right? There was a community that allowed you to do that. Like someone who is really good at Kung Fu right now. Someone brought them there and put, put Right, and there is a temple there for their correct, use. Correct. There is a space there and there is guidance too. Right, right. So, so, so that, that concept, which I'm, I'm looking at my notes here of that it's a community of people needs to help that person who then becomes an outlier really means that no one really does it on their own. And, um, and so I, when I heard him say that, I was like, wow, that is such a huge part of that concept of 10,000 hours. Because what we took out of it is like, wow, we, we've got to work really hard. We've got to put in this time. Um, well, okay, that's what I took out of yeah. it, right? And then if you don't have the overarching concept of, but a lot of people helped me get there, which I think is ingrained in, in our philosophy, right? Um, but if you don't have that, then when you become this outlier, 
then when you're retelling your story, right, going back to retelling the story, what happened or what it is that we think happened, then we tell that story that way. Here's what I did. And uh, I think, I don't know. So you're, the first thing that you said about gratitude, how grateful you are. Like we then, we then forget to be grateful for. What's interesting is when you bring out outliers, the first thing that I recall isn't necessarily the 10,000 hours. Obviously that was huge. But for me was just thinking about how my dad is an outlier and all of the circumstances in which that led him to be that way. He was able to escape China, but it's because he was an oyster farmer. So he had a pass to be mm -hmm. able to go out into the sampan boats at night to say he was hot, which allowed him then to escape to La Vaussan. And then he had this unique skill of Kung Fu that he happened to learn in his village. I won't do the whole history lecture here, but it was all very unique to him being born where he was and his father making sure he learned that. Like to me, it was all of the moving elements around him that then propelled him forward. Now he is exceptional. We literally a week ago now, we saw him jump up after an all day event mm -hmm. of just go, go, go and started just doing kicks and jump kicks and he's 85, right? That's, that's not normal. Like it's he's not, not a normal. normal human being, but what I took of it was an outlier. It's like, yes, it's somebody that has all the excellence, does the 10,000, but there's all these circumstances that are really unique that a lot, like the stars align. So then you people. got what he wanted out of it. I guess so. So that's Because good. I was thinking, wow, you know, it's not just because my dad was the mm -hmm. hardest worker in his Kung Fu class. Yeah. It's just all these elements. And then when he got to Hong Kong, then he became a seaman again. Mm -hmm. And then he was a good swimmer because he was a Sha mm -hmm. oyster farmer. And that's why he could swim to shore for, to America. Because right. not everybody could make that swim. You know, there's just so many factors. And, you know, he, he a lot of his charisma and his hard work came into play. I don't want to use the word luck but timing and circumstance and the people around him always wanting to help him. I think I, I, think is... I can say this now, but he's never taken a driver's test. <laughs> well, now that he's not driving anymore. Now that he's not driving anymore, but the man has a license. So yeah. I'll let you guys figure that one out, right? And there's just so many people always wanting because they believe in him and, it, and his hard work ethic. But my mom, who speaks perfect English, was able to uplift and be that other cornerstone right. to Wallum that was needed to be Correct. able to make it thrive. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be what him. it was with just this amazing Kung Fu practitioner who didn't speak English, right? So it's just like, for me, that's what I took from it when I read it. It's almost like I was reading the path that was laid out for my dad in a sense. When I, when I think back on that book, and it's been several years since I've read mm -hmm. it, but I remember being super impressioned by it. Yeah, and, and so then the other part that, it, that in that conversation was, well, if that's really the point that he wanted to put out, then is that hackable? Like, can you then cut the 10,000 hours? And I think something like the summit that we had, the Wallum Summit, is a way to cut that curve. Now, does that make someone really good? No, but the amount of knowledge that was surrounded in one place and the exposure that students get from multiple plate instructors is sort of a hack, right? The amount of knowledge they were to get, now they've got to still put in the work, but that is, also another community of people that are helping and we at the temple even outside of the summit have it where we have someone like two one of the super two one of the instructors who has these amazing skills of of of, mo of moving well and, and knowing the forms you have one of our other instructors jason who is an amazing musician and has kind of catapulted our the drumming skills we have you know all these instructors and even the assistant instructors all of them together exposing students in a way that generations before were not where there was only one instructor so then that it doesn't cut it right it's not hackable where okay what would take you 10,000 hours now only takes you five you still got to put in I think that much work but that experience can be even richer if you want it to be what I take away from what you yeah. kind of just said like was jumping out at me was say there's a student there and this will happen Maybe in five years, maybe in 10 years, maybe in 20 years, mm -hmm. someone will come to us and say, hey, I was at that Wallum Summit where you had all those instructors and one of them said this and it inspired me to, to do, do this, this. Right. and now look what I'm doing now. Right. I've taken that principle or it inspired me in that moment. It got me on the path I needed to for whatever it was. It may not even be martial related because mm -hmm. I've heard it so many times. 
the door that's open in Wallum, people walk through it and then they walk out of it because it is a revolving door. We right. don't have people that stay forever for the most part, right? And But they take something with them and it's usually not a kick and a punch. Right. And what it does is change their lives in a way. And that is why I teach because I thought about as a teenager looking at my dad and how he was able to change lives and 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 make an impact through doing martial arts there were so many other things that were good that was coming out of that mm-hmm. and so my hope is that all of those people if even 10 percent of them of a couple hundred people go out and do something amazing and it was like this moment helped that in some way whether it was inspiration whether it was actual knowledge right. whether it was just being meeting a community of people that then gave them support confidence friendship things they didn't have before like filling a void i think those are the things that's like really exciting is that it's a spark right it doesn't have to be well you know this person only has put in that ten thousand hours etc cetera, etc cetera, mm-hmm. right like it's like being exposed to that can ignite something and be the catalyst and i think in the lecture one of the central focus of what I wanted to talk about was the philosophy of Wallam, not just the historical aspects, but how that intertwined and how we came up with our philosophy. It's because the villagers of Shajang wanted to show gratitude right. and honor and come up with principles that go hand in hand with Kung Fu training, but who we should be as Wallam practitioners. And I wanted to take that and flip it around and like not just apply it to what you all do in the classroom. Because when I asked questions, everybody said something that was mostly applicable to in the training hall. A couple people were really great about it. Like, oh, I, I'm kind to other people. Right, right. I hold the door open. I loved that, right? But then I want them to think about how they can take those principles and then extend them out into the world. Because that's how we get things like change right. to happen with this, especially with this younger generation. They're going to have so many tools at their disposal, almost too many. You just want them to be able to learn how to focus that so that they can then put out some good energy and do something really remarkable, which I'm sure many will. And we will never know mm-hmm. half of them that do it. They won't even let us know. But if one or two come back, that would be nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, the... So that, it's that, I guess, that main concept of if you look at yourself as you're part of this bigger thing, right? Uh, um, as a Wallum student, you're part of the Wallum system in your school, which is part of something bigger. But even then, how in your lecture you were thinking of, I want people to go out into the world outside of Kung Fu and do things, and then we're part of that bigger community. Um, if we can all kind of have that broader scope, then it would hopefully lead to better interactions, right, on a personal level, which, uh, which would lead to better things. I'm going to make a big jump right now. Okay. Not a like physical, physically jump? Not a physical okay. jump. Should I move? I was wondering but if I need to get out of the way. It's a big jump, but I think it's the same thing based okay. on these notes that I have. Okay. Okay. There is an article. This is all in that same talk, by the way. Uh, that Malcolm Gladwell reference, which he said it was one of, and I don't know how many years ago this was, but where he was reading it at the time and said, this is an article that really is the most fascinating article that I'm reading right now. And it's, and, uh, it's called The Whole United States is Southern. Did we talk about this? I don't recall. Okay. But please. Let me, so let me just give you a little bit of a recap. This is not going to be a full recap, but it's basically the concept of this article is that this strategy was that the um, the strategy of the, of the Southerners at the time, and I don't want to put it all as a broad stroke, but the strategy of the Southerners was that they won because they personalized racism instead of institutionalized racism, right? So, so just hear me out here. This is, the big, this is the concept here. <laughs> because I started off with how we all make it all about ourselves, right? Okay. And it's because... We are so much better at being intuitive like psychologists, like intuitive about what are the things, the behaviors that make people, that are their motivations, their values individually. And we're really horrible at seeing what those collective forces are. So on one end where I was saying, hey, we should really see that we're bigger, a bigger picture. 
and that'll make us better people. Unfortunately, with things that you see on certain news stations, they personalize racism or this wasn't in the article, but they personalize gun violence. Oh, it's one mad man who did it. Or, oh, that was just one racist cop who did it. Or one racist, you know, and because we're so bad at looking at, well, these are all the institutional reasons of why these things are happening. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what my main point is with this, <laughs> except to say that it's both sides of the, same, of the same coin. It's two sides of the same coin. For ourselves, we should be looking at, hey, the reason that I'm really good at whatever this thing is that's happening is because of all of the help that I have with family, with my community, but also a lot of the negative things that are happening isn't always just because of me, right? There are institutional reasons that things that we, we are forced to sometimes make choices. And, um, and this concept from this article of why, hey, the whole United States is Southern is when you see something like as horrible as what happened with George Floyd, there was this huge spark, right? Where it says, we can't take this anymore. But it started to dies down and, and you hear back now to, well, that was just one individual who did that. Right. So are we talking about systemic racism? Right, right. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean we, you and I both know that. What I'm saying is it's the same concept, right? Yeah, it's the yeah. same concept of if I do something really well or I'm an outlier, it's outlier. It's not all my fault, right? And if one person does something really bad, it's they grew up in an environment that allowed that to happen. It's not just that one person who's bad. We have, yeah, to, well, we have a, to look at bigger things. A, there is a but, series of events that led them to that moment that had there not been systemic racism or poverty or all of these things that are ingrained in our culture here in the United States, like had that, had that not been that way, would then, you know, this is like the, the trading places thing, right? Like it's like, okay, if you're taken out of your environment, and you're given all of the stuff, are you inherently good, evil, right. or, or, or is it nature, nurture kind of thing, right? And, um, and yeah, I, I, see where, I see what you mean by the flip side of it, because yeah. it's understanding that we aren't the hero, like a superhero of our story where we don't need anything around us yeah. for all of the positive things to happen but on the flip side too when bad things happen like sometimes it's because people are given a really shitty hand to begin with yeah and i guess and it's like almost saying like well you're gonna start right here but you who's a little darker um i'm gonna dig this hole about 20 feet below and i'm gonna drop you in it with no way to get out and then the race is gonna start right right we've seen that, go, that kind of video right and so but but i guess there's there's <laughs> definitely that and i guess the other part is because we individualize it, we can distance ourselves from it, right? Even for anything, sexism, right? I consider myself a feminist, but I know I've probably done <laughs> some sexist things in the past. But if we individualize it, it's very easy for me to say, no, that's not me. I'm not that person, right? But if you look at it as the whole institutionalized, then it's easier to say, okay, we're all kind of a part of it. Even if I'm a good person, I know that there has to be bigger things to do. Well, this that is the whole to how to be an anti-racist thing, right? Right. It's and like people, we're all racist and we're all trying to be anti-racist. And people are really triggered by that. Oh, super triggered. Right? But, White fragility. They don't like these words. Right, right. And they're right. just words. We but just I guess, kind of have to own that as humans, there are a lot of things inherently about us that we have to improve upon. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know. I guess in on both sides, on the things that end up being negative like racism or sexism or whatever it is um, and the things that end up helping us, we have to realize that we're all benefiting from a certain system that's in place. And I don't have the answer. I have no idea what the answer is. But I think it can start with realizing like what we talked about in the beginning, which is, oh, wait, I'm, I'm, rev I'm revising my history based on what I think happened as opposed to what actually happened. Yeah. And just constantly questioning yourself can then lead to hopefully some more empathy for people, which then, you know, it's like that domino effect, but that's only the start, right? I don't know if that's really the answer. I have no idea, but I guess that's, I guess the grand, I don't know, the grand theme of like 
my notes there that I that I that I, that I had on my laptop. The kind of starting from there. Yeah, it's funny because when you and I sit and have this type of conversation on, and we go, okay, we're going to podcast, we're going to do a stretching thing, so we're moving around a little, and we're not like stuck in chairs anymore. I, I do like this format better. Thanks to uh, our pal Jason Chu for saying, why don't you guys like work out or something and maybe it'll be more interesting. But at the very least, we feel better about it. You know? Yeah. Um, a few weeks ago, we were in Portland with a lot of my comic creator friends and we had some very lovely dinners. Mm -hmm. And you and I would leave these conversations going, wow, very cerebral, really highly in intellectual conversations. And I don't know that- With like, a lot of a, meat. A lot of meat, <laughs> not Actually, for food, meat. but like, yeah. And I think when you and I sit and have these conversations, it, it goes along those lines and uh, in that in that track of like, okay, we're gonna digest and, and dig into stuff. But you know, on a, a daily basis, you don't really kind of get into those conversations. Mm -hmm. But it was funny when we were in Portland with with these, a lot of them writers, the lovely, amazing Rucka family, whom all of which the entire are, family are extremely brilliant. <laughs> brilliant and just kind of had us like our brains, our gears were working, like just the entire family, not just Greg, who I get to speak to all the time, but it was just, we really left feeling, um, what's the word, stimulated, right? Very, very stimulated. Yeah, really stimulated. So I think that these are healthy conversations to have. And I feel like maybe people on a daily basis don't get to kind of jump in and, and dissect that. And this is why friends of ours that want to have philosophical conversations. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm just too tired. I just want to relax and talk about this TV show or, oh my God, you this have is to be, so funny. You have to be in the mood. You kind of have to be in the mood and the environment. It can't be forced. But even saying that sometimes we force it by giving us ourselves a timeline, like where you say, hey, we're going to podcast. I'm like, all right, cool. And um, I do put notes down. And a lot of times it's stuff that I know that, well, I would never put this in a newsletter to my students because there's no way that I could make that. And I would never really um, do a one minute video on it. Right. But I have no problem speaking to you about it and even fumbling through my thought process. And maybe someone who listens to it go, what the hell is Oscar saying? Or, man, I wish that he had said this or even I think this is what he meant. He could have said this better. All of those things to me is great because it, hopefully it'll spark people to think in a pot in something positive. I have, I don't care at all at how much I'm fumbling through what this thought process was that I had, right. As I was speaking through it, because it happens to me all the time where I listen to someone who's brilliant, either through a podcast or a conversation. I was like, wow, that was amazing what they said. Um, and sometimes I listen to conversations where you hear them processing. And what, what I get out of it is like what that little thing that you said earlier that when you did your your lecture, if you can have the someone take one thing out of it. So everything that I had said earlier and this entire conversation so far, even if right now as I'm even speaking going, wow, I don't know if I made any sense, I don't really care <laughs> because hopefully someone got something out of it, like one thing. And then they go, okay, I think this is what he meant. And, and hopefully that thing isn't a negative thing where they leave pissed. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. I, right. I want to say this last month of my life, I have been really encouraged about continuing this podcast because I've gotten feedback, meaning I actually was out in public space where people would tell me they're actually listening to these conversations. So thanks for that. And not that I didn't think people were listening, because obviously there's statistics on, oh, there's downloads and mm -hmm. hundreds of downloads here or whatever. Some of the early ones having over 10,000 or something, right? Like, I know people are quote unquote listening or at least downloading and stuff, but I think I've been better about engaging in things like the Lazarus Discord, where I get mm -hmm. to see people's feedback. And, and I've been trying to be better about interacting, even though I'm a bit shy in that space which is interesting because i really like being face to face i right. like being in public but when it comes to oh i don't i don't like being an online presence where i'm just like typing mm -hmm. answers and things that's just not my persona but i like to read and, and keep up and so just being at comic con and hearing people react so positively 
and seeing even on social media comments about us, you know, especially Greg and I getting people through the pandemic. Yeah. That is so amazing to me that it made me feel I mean, obviously, there's a lot of things going on out in the world that mm-hmm. is very important, but it made me feel like, wow, this is actually important because it mattered to at least one person and it right. made a difference for at least one person. And obviously, I would like to have like 10,000 people listening, but it it does make it s- super encouraging for me to want to continue knowing that the people that I have met I'm very happy that it's been positive for them and that they're listening and that these conversations are enriching in some Mm -hmm. way or there's one takeaway. So I'm very appreciative for those of you who leave a comment on social or for those on on the YouTube. We just found out there's people leaving comments there. Oh, what a surprise. We didn't know um, because we're really bad about social, but we're, we're trying to track that so we can respond. But just getting feedback has been really valuable for me and not just validating, but also it just feels good. It feels nice to go, wow, okay, the, that one podcast that we put out, people commented on our Machu Picchu one. Yeah, you know what? I think so, people like hearing about the our frustration with the whole alien thing. <laughs> yeah. So you tell me when, when there are comments about, let's say, our conversation. I was like, oh, yeah. But um, even a, another great benefit is over the years is how – much you've improved your listening skills, your speaking skills, your ability to 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 lead a conversation, right, or interview or, or kind of flow through it. So all those skills over these past years that you've been doing the podcast have just drastically improved. And then it allows for then with some preparation for you to deliver a lecture in person or what or when you were at Rose City Comic Con have panels where you're in person. Um, you know, it's like an accumulation of all these skills, boom, boom, boom. And so that when then you are presented with opportunity to where you like to be face to face with someone, then you can be of the highest impact. And I think that to me is the best. It's amazing to get feedback, obviously, like it feels really good. But to me, the best thing is that it's just you continuously honing this skill, which will then eventually spark that one idea in someone. It could be this conversation or it could be you're just even more prepared when you're in front of someone face to face. And that's why I kind of went back. I said what I said earlier as far as um, I don't really care like me fumbling through it because when I then have a similar type of conversation in person, maybe I'll be better suited for it, right? I, I would have practiced it a little bit. Um, I can do it with a little more empathy. I can listen more. And um, it goes back to also why a few weeks ago, I had told you, I was like, I'm just unfollowing everyone from social media and I'm only posting for myself, for my own benefit, <laughs> for like, how can I improve my skills in communication? And I still haven't done a really good job with that, but it allows you then to not feel the pressure of like, I need to put out this amazing content. I'm just like, I'm putting out content that I'm trying to improve. So. While you were speaking, I had a thought and now I think I've lost it. This happens a lot. To be a little behind the scenes for you all, podcasters. As an interviewer. As an interviewer, sometimes I really want to be an intent listener. And so therefore, I'm not thinking about the question I have next or what I want to say because I'm just absorbing. And then I've lost it because if it goes for a certain moment Well, you're time, also not taking notes. Sometimes don't you take notes, notes when you... I try to take notes, but I feel like when I have looked back on those... Because it's Zoom and it's so flat as it is. Like so if, if you're I'm looking sitting away. here doing this or looking away, I feel mm-hmm. like it looks so horrible to be off camera. Like, let me type this thing. Uh, it would probably benefit my editors if I took better notes so that they can go, okay, you know, here's the quote I want you to pull for the mm-hmm. quote card. Or I try to be so intent on it that I often get lost in that. And then a technique that this is so too much information, I think, that I have is I often will just start talking and as I speak, something will come to me. <laughs> I've seen that live. <laughs> you pull it off because really well, you though. know what I had planned or you know, like me. It's well, just I know you, you know yeah. me so and, well. And so when you, I can hear the half second pause, which is you saying, where, where am I going? Okay, and then you usually just boom, pick up. I think um, on my side, I don't have. These conversations I mainly just have with you. I don't think I have long conversations with with too many people <laughs> consistently, except for sometimes with clients. 
And that's where I still feel I need to have like an intention. So I don't know, I just thought of this now, but whenever we do these podcasts, we just do a podcast and I wonder if it would be beneficial to us and to any of our two listeners if they were... If well, we were, you know, Aaron is listening. Aaron, Aaron Wide from Kauai, you know, we love you. Right. Because he says he, listen, he loves your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right. So see, I know that I have one person, but... Um, <laughs> All the way in Kauai. Yeah, he's a, that guy's amazing. Uh, <laughs> how does he consume so much? It's really impressive. Um, so um, <laughs> I wonder if it would be beneficial if before we were to do this, I don't know if it would be, if before we do this, we were to say, okay, what would make this next hour successful? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like say, okay, if at the end of this hour we've done this, then we've, we're good to go. I don't know if it's beneficial and let me tell you why. Because whenever I listen back to these podcasts, <laughs> go on, let the audience know, hero. <laughs> I listen to every single one that we. Do. Well, I listen to all your and podcasts. I never listen. I never listen. I listen by the to way. All... listeners, so you know, I don't listen back, and I don't even edit these anymore. Thank you, Jake. Um, I listen and my back. Yeah. Team. Yep, no. I listen to all your podcasts. Okay. Thank and you. And even this, this live conversation, whenever you release it, I listen to it, and I was like. That was dope. These two guys are amazing. <laughs> what chemistry they have. It's almost like they've been married for a hundred years. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, it's definitely, there's definitely some vanity, right? There's definitely some weird Okay, he doesn't vanity. believe this, but I do believe Oscar likes the sound of his voice. <laughs> I do. And then, I actually believe he likes the sound and of his then, voice. Whereas I hate the sound of my voice, <laughs> listeners, just so you know. Uh, then, Gentle listener, as my dear friend Dan, Coach Dan John would say. There has never been any of these podcasts that while I'm speaking during the com conversation, I'm like, what a shit show, Oscar. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> Maybe and, this one. This one might be the Wait, one. no, I don't think so. I really don't think so. And then I'm thinking that right now. Okay, I'm literally thinking that right now. And I will listen to this podcast. I know you will. Whenever you release it. And I will tell you, I was like, that podcast was dope. <laughs> That is definitely going to happen. Both things are happening. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell am I saying? I sound like a bumbling idiot. <laughs> and when I listen back, that was legit. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, legit is the best song on Nas's third album, King's Disease. So King's Disease, you know, he released three okay. albums. And I like Nas. I think he's great. But out of the entire album yeah. of King's Disease 3, legit is the best song. Okay. I think that people should know that. Uh, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, where are you going with legit? Is this going to be some sort of like derivative class where you're going to break down? I don't know if it's the heat, down? but I started laughing. I almost started crying. I oh, could feel wow. tears coming out of my eyes. Which is very rare because this one does not cry oh, unless we poke him in the eye or something. That's pretty funny. Um. It's funny because I will hear, and not that it's a surprise, but it is because not that you and I sit down and plan what we're going to talk about. I just go, let's just go for it. And you do make your notes and you have certain topics that you want to go over. Or often we've just had an event or something top of mind, a trip, something we really want to talk about the culture of. So we decide we're going to share that. And and you and I talking is not very difficult for us, so we don't really practice. But I will say earlier in my podcast, years, I would have pages of questions and notes and specifics. And now, even with someone I've never met, it's pretty limited. I would say maybe there's three point lines. Um, I just interviewed Nana, which Chain Gang All-Stars, everybody, it is the book to read this year. But can I just, can you hold your thought real quick about that? Okay, I was just going to oh, say sorry. about the notes. Okay, go ahead. Um, even though I had notes about mm -hmm. the book and things I wanted to ask, and then there was stuff that I had researched. So I did have like some things, right? Because this is an author, probably won't get to talk to all the time and also never met before. So I do have to have some organization. But now in my, what, sixth, seventh year of podcasting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just kind of go... All right, who am I speaking to? Especially <laughs> Greg, all I, all I do is change the number. Greg 53 take that out grade 54 just so i can keep a track like i pretty much never have anything uh note wise but 
they are further and fewer in between because I have found, and maybe it's just because it's easier for me or mm -hmm. because it's been my nature, what's natural is that the conversation that's super organic and not so like, okay, let me ask you this question. The more I used to try to be like the Tim Ferriss mm -hmm. or the so-and-so and I would listen to their podcasts and, okay, how do they ask questions? What do they say? Or Howard Stern. I'm like, I can't be those people. I just have to do what's kind of natural for me. And hopefully people will like that. And since I've been getting pretty decent feedback, it makes me feel, again, that validation that what I'm doing is well and uh, in no way to make other podcasts seem what you know you're uh, making not it as you're making it make natural it for you natural for me right. and it works for me and it works for my audience i think so so i feel really comfortable with that so yes we could sit down and plan is this, this is a long answer to your question <laughs> but i don't know that we really need to <laughs> no that's why i said it and even while i was saying i was like we're not gonna plan anything <laughs> But what I was gonna, what I interrupted you for was because you brought up Chain Gang All Stars, and my question is: Do you consider me an emotional person? Like rah, having big emotions? Actually, it. I would say you are emotional about certain things, like food. Correct. <laughs> And <laughs> certain aspects of your work and I would say those two things generally speaking like if we're talking about you being kind of here an emotion meaning there's mm -hmm. a spike yeah. in something mm -hmm. yeah I would say food is the <laughs> highest one and then some frustration like if you've had a rough work kind of moment there's a little reactiveness, like your reactiveness, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then when you're tired, I think there's like an exhaustion, like you just, right, yeah. You, but, okay, I think yeah. that's a great answer. But okay. I guess the reason I asked that question is because I felt emotional about this freaking book. I know. And I, know. Um, I can say this probably with 100% certainty. We are part of a book club. Mm -hmm. I don't think they even listen to this podcast. No. And so I, I love these people. Mm -hmm. But they, one of these people from our book club said, oh, that book was all right. And I had an emotion bissel reaction. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Where I was like, are you fucking kidding me? You thought Chain Gang All Stars was just all right? This book was amazing. <laughs> Only because you have very different tastes. Right. And you know books that these and I, this person likes. And you're thinking... How can you even put it in the same realm? It's like it's like masterpieces compared to like kids' nursery rhymes. You're going, wait, what? Yeah. Like the level of yeah. skill. Um, so there's a lot of books that I can appreciate that it is really well written, but it may be not my cup of tea. Correct. But I can recognize, okay, this is clearly, mm -hmm. I think a lot of those fantasy, sci-fi mm -hmm. um What's the one? Nemesis and J.K. JK Nemesis. JK Nem like clearly amazing. I but I don't get it. Like I have, so, I, I get lost. Yeah. Clearly, there's skill that I just can't grasp, and so for me, they're not my kind of books. But I can recognize that there's talent. I've heard the podcast. I love this person when I'm listening to the podcast. Game I'm recognized like, game. Amazing, really is, yeah. but not my kind of book. And I understand the person that I'm speaking of was having the same thing. So just not my cup of book. Mm -hmm. But because I because I, I was so enthralled with this book. You really were. At, I was like, this book is so good. Yes, um, yes. And, um, but it, it just hit me at the right time. It, it spoke to me directly. But, but then I had this reaction, <laughs> which is the only thing that I can compare it to is when I would have arguments about like hip hop music. I was like, what? <laughs> Yes. Get out of here with your nonsense. Yes. You don't know what you're talking yes. about. Yes. And um, but but I I I I say that, and I realize that everyone has different tastes. I mean, I'll, I'll, you, do you want to hear a pet peeve of mine that I, I've been Please. thinking about recently? Please, emotional Oscar. <laughs> this is skip. I'm jumping ahead to something else. We've talked about this in the past. I hate. Hate is a strong word. I really dislike when a student, a kung fu student, especially an a quote advanced student mm. says, wow, that class was too easy. Okay. This is coming out of left field. But... Right? Because I'm on I'm on this um train of like what is what things that irk me. <laughs> okay. New podcast I, title for today's I, episode. I think that advanced martial arts practitioners 
should be able to manage the intensity of, of any class on their own. And when someone has been doing martial arts for years and they take a, any class from what would be considered a beginner class to an advanced class, they should have the ability to scale that class while they're in it with their intensity, their intention, uh, their moving of the body <laughs> mechanics. And um, I ha this is top of mind because I'm going to write a news a, an email newsletter okay. about it. <laughs> All right. And um, it just kind of irks me whenever I would hear that in the past. Oh, that class was too easy. I would be like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> well, my thought is just that they're a neophyte and they know nothing about themselves, how to, to move with intent. They're not there yet. Right. They're just not at the level of martial totally arts under in their martial arts journey where they understand what they should be doing to benefit themselves. Totally understandable for, I think, anyone in the first three to five years. But five years to me, I it's think it's disappointing. Start... It's disappointing, but honestly, not surprising. It's, dis it's disappointing because I'm like, we are failing you as instructors. <laughs> it all comes back to me. Don't you see that? So, <laughs> and um, I don't know. It's this thing where I heard I was um, listening to something with uh, this isometric um, training. Okay. And the person said, um, intensity is needed for adaptation but also over time you should be able to scale the class make it easier make it harder with your skills and it just made me it just had this spark in my memory of someone like turning to me at the end of a class going well that class was kind of easy a class that i partook in and i'm like you're crazy man <laughs> <laughs> don't make me lose our respect for you what's wrong with you <laughs> that's a, that's that brings up a good point though because it's really disappointing this but was again, someone who had been doing kung fu not longer than I. Surprising, it's disappointing, but not surprising. And even for people who have been doing things for 10, 20 mm -hmm. years, because there is just unfortunately, I feel like because of my exposure level to what I have been exposed to in mm -hmm. Walam from my dad's journey and seeing what he's been through, there's just no point in time where you can feel safe from disappointment. <laughs> Regardless of how long you've known someone. So two hours ago when we did Tai Chi with your parents, I, <laughs> I was doing Tai Chi with uh, your mom and your dad. And I, we're doing it at, at the house, right? So there's yeah. like walls in the way. And it's making me adjust my stance. Yeah. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, no. She's going to see that I, my stance is off. Uh-oh. Here it comes. <laughs> But and you don't want to make an excuse like, I oh, I stepped this way I, because there I was a wall there. You don't want to be that. As a student, you don't want to be like, oh, yeah, I know that. It's a wall there. It's, like, it's more of like, yep, you're right. I did. <laughs> I should have made an adjustment there. <laughs> but I'll tell you what. This one today was great. I had a really good, it was a good vibe doing the Tai Chi. Your chi flow was on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That, that is a whole, you need to, okay, you need to write that down one day as let's chi talk flow? about. <laughs> the weirdness of just kung fu and tai chi like as far as like the how many hours you got <laughs> <laughs> right. but um anyway that is going to be my next email to our students okay it's gonna the title is that class was too easy question mark oh and then i'm gonna do a little rant Ooh. but in a nice way we i need to come up with a good rant catchphrase for you like i have rucka rant like mm -hmm. it wasn't really hard because his name That's is rucka and it's yeah. just alliteration mm -hmm. and i mean i i consider myself so brilliant for something that was so naturally it's probably actually really already, already there because um, it also it flows nice off the mouth like yes, rucka rant, rucka rant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so i i gotta think of one for you because it's more like don't overthink it a vex kind of <laughs> for me it would be like vex right that yeah. would be because i always say i'm a vex but mm -hmm. uh i'll have to i'll have to ponder that it's not coming as 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 quickly as, as you would quickly want. as i would want yeah i think I, i'm gonna overthink it yeah don't overthink it um let's bring it back to where we started okay which is everything that happens it's all about us <laughs> yeah. all right and with that everybody it's it's as always a lovely time talking to oscar Likewise. Thank you so much for this. I can't and wait to I can't wait to hear this. For you viewers, <laughs> uh, I did a little bit of stretching today. I tried to get some moving around and 
it's just really gloomy here in Orlando. And so it just kind of made me want to kind of lay down and take a nap while talking to you or like lay down. And I don't know, that would have been appropriate. So stretching was minimal, but love to hear your comments. Leave us some feedback because as you've heard, I love feedback and, you know, positive only, obviously. <laughs> and no, for me, leave please. feedback or don't because obviously I don't care. <laughs> Because I'm going to listen to this He's podcast listen later. He's going to listen man, we're dope. Yeah, and I'm going to like, actually, I'll probably walk into wherever you're in, put my hand up and be like, and high five you. And you look at me and say, you listen to the podcast. And I was like, yeah, and it was great. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. Well, thanks as always. And uh, we'll catch you all next time. Bye. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for listening to The Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Please subscribe and rate my podcast on your platform of choice and leave a review. You can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash Chan to help keep this podcast going. Follow me and interact on social media at Chan on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook.